Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Pod Fix. This will be the continuation of Fellow Feeling. This will be Part 7, Chapter 6, entitled Hanging in the Balance. For one singular moment, the world stands still. Shota can't take his eyes off of the bleeding, unconscious villain, slumped motionless against the ground with Ryuko's fangs still buried in his shoulder. His eyes are still partially open, glazed and sightless, and his chest moves shallow and pained in his unconscious state. Even after Bakugo's inhumanly powerful explosion and Ryuku's bite, he's still alive. He's a monster. But now isn't the time to focus on that. Ryuku draws back, her muzzle dripping with blood, breath puffing exhaustedly from her nostrils. She takes a few staggering steps backwards, swaying with the exertion of the fight, and crashes down on her haunches. Ryuku! One of her sidekicks exclaims, beginning to approach, but the hero just shakes her head sharply. Emergency services, she questions, her voice low and faint. She must have used up a tremendous amount of power during that fight, based on the way her dragon form is starting to wilt. The sidekick stops, stricken. With the villain defeated, they've been cleared to approach. They're already inbound. Th then, she lifts her head with great effort, pointing her snout towards what remains of the tunnels. Get to the students. His students. Shota tries to get up, but Bakugo's explosion has taken its toll. He hadn't been the target, but he'd been close enough to receive a debilitating amount of damage. His ears are still ringing. He suspects that his right eardrum has been ruptured, while the left is slowly beginning to pick up on the surrounding noise, faint though it may be. His light concussion from that initial encounter with the villain now feels like it's crossed the line into moderate, as moving sends a wave of nausea rolling through him. When paired with a flurry of aches that now grip his body as a result of being thrown by the villain, he feels unequivocally terrible. A racer head! One of Ryuku's sidekicks, she helps him to his feet, eyes wide and concerned, laying a hand on his chest when he sways. You should rest, she tries, even as he takes a determined step in the direction of the tunnels. You're badly hurt! I'm fine, he snaps, because he knows what it feels like to nearly die, and this isn't it. He can make it to the tunnels. He can find his students. They have to be alive. The sidekick chews her lower lip, but she doesn't protest. Instead, she slots herself up under his shoulder, using his good arm to help support his weight, and helps him limp painfully to the mouth of the destroyed tunnel. He peers down into the rubble, and his heart stops. The sidekick supporting him gasps. Ryuku! But Ryuku can't help them. She's already lost her dragon form, shrinking into an exhausted, battered woman instead of a scaly beast. She won't be able to fly anyone to safety. They'll have to wait for emergency services to arrive. Shota shrugs off the sidekick's arm and drops down into the puddle of debris and blood at the bottom of the tunnel, his heart in his throat. Bakugo is collapsed there on his side, blood dripping in thick rivulets down his arm, eyes rolled back in his head. The arm that had issued that massive explosion is purpled and bleeding, as if the shock wave had been so intense that it had burst every blood vessel it could reach. Bakugo. Bakugo! He grasps his student's shoulder, giving him a light shake, but he gets no response. When he draws back, his hand is painted red. It's a lot of blood. The blows he'd taken in order to defend Midoriya had been nothing short of devastating. And speaking of Midoriya, Shota hardly wants to look. He'd been in such a terrible condition the last time he'd seen him, and that had been at least an hour ago. And who knows if the villain had gotten his claws back into him before Bakugo had managed to distract him. There's no use in delaying. He has to know. It looks like when Bakugo had fallen, he trapped Midoriya beneath him, a last-ditch effort to shield him from further harm, if Shota had to guess, though it had been extremely misguided. He gets an arm beneath Bakugo's shoulders, starts to lift him off of his classmate, and... N no Shota recoils as Bakugo's bloodied fingers curl around his wrist, leaving slick fingerprints atop his skin. How is he even conscious? Bakugo's eyelids flutter like he's fighting to stay awake, his grip tightening on Shota's wrist until it's almost painful. N not gonna let you. It's barely legible, but Shota understands him nonetheless. No one is going to hurt Midoriya. Both of you are safe. Bakugo gives a relieved huff, his grip slackening. Promise? I promise. But by the time the words have left his lips, Bakugo is already out. In the silence that follows, Shota hears the whine of approaching sirens. Turning, he orders the sidekick. 
Take him. Now. The girl drops down into the tunnel without a word, heaving Bakugo over her shoulder and passing him up to another sidekick so he can be extracted from the pit. But Shota sees none of this, because his efforts have finally, finally, uncovered Midoriya from his place beneath his classmate. His first relieved thought is that the bandages are still in place, and he doesn't seem to have been struck by the villain a second time. Bakugo's protection of him had been complete and unyielding. But when he looks closer, he realizes that despite the lack of fresh blood, his condition has deteriorated severely. He looks almost like porcelain, lying still on the rubble that coats the tunnel floor. When Shota touches gently at his cheek, his skin is freezing. Midoriya, he whispers, hoping that somehow, impossibly, he might still be conscious. But Midoriya says nothing. He doesn't even twitch. And when Shota slides his hand down, settling his palm over his chest, he realizes why. Midoriya isn't breathing. The panic that sears through him is so suffocating that for a moment, he can't convince himself to inhale. Every second matters now, he knows that, but the venom in his veins is digging up every death he's ever witnessed, every person he's ever been unable to save, and the thought that Midoriya might be one of those people is so horrifying that it's almost unbearable. No. No. He has to get himself under control, check his pulse, just to be sure. His fingers press into Midoriya's throat, and to his shock, he feels one singular flutter. His body is still burning through the last of the oxygen in his bloodstream. He must have stopped breathing moments ago. And that means that there's still a chance. Shota jerks back, calling to one of the sidekicks. Get him out of this pit now! He stopped breathing! He needs CPR! Because with his broken arm, there's no way he'll be able to administer it himself, not long enough for the paramedics to arrive. The sidekicks waste no time. Bakugo has already been laid out flat on the ground, someone pressing down on the worst of his wounds, and Shota can only watch as Midoriya is whisked out from under him and carried to the surface. It's horrifying, watching him be lifted out, the way his head bows back over the sidekick's arm, his expression slack and lifeless, the way his arm dangles, swinging loosely as he's carried out, the way his chest remains completely, horrifically still. In the underground, he'd participated in rescues like this more than once, lifting civilians out of disaster zones, searching the rubble for survivors. More often than not, it would end like this, fishing bodies from beneath layers of rock and steel, lifting them, feeling their dead weight sag against his chest, and bearing them to the surface so that their families would have something to fill their caskets. Now, looking at Midoriya, all he can see are those bodies he used to extract from the rubble. Your turn. Someone informs him, trying to guide him up the sloping edge of the pit, but he hardly hears them. Eraserhead, you need to move. He blinks. The world is starting to spin, his chest growing tighter and tighter. His head feels like lead, his brutalized arm a white-hot question mark of pain as his adrenaline begins to fade. He's been running on fumes for hours by now, and even though his instincts are screaming at him to stay awake to make sure that his students are all right, he isn't sure he's going to be able to keep himself from passing out. You know what? Says a very disgruntled sidekick who's probably handled one too many injured heroes today. You don't get a choice. You're coming out of that pit and you're doing it now. Distantly, Shota thinks that he likes this sidekick, but he doesn't have much time to dwell upon it before the hands around his shoulders grow firmer, tugging him up and forcibly hauling him over the edge of the pit created by the collapsed tunnel. The sirens are so loud up here. Why are they so loud? The sidekick's hands are replaced by someone else's grasping his uninjured arm with gentle confidence, and Shota doesn't bother looking where he's going as he sat down on something soft. He feels half a second from passing out, but he clings to a consciousness out of fear for his students' lives. He has to make sure they're okay. As soon as he knows they'll live, he can rest. Something lands around his shoulders, heavy and soft. A... a blanket. A shock blanket. Is he going into shock? Maybe it's not so surprising, after struggling to keep his students alive for hours, after watching Midoriya be lifted unresponsive from the bottom of a blood-soaked tunnel. He reaches up with his good arm, touching at the blanket. It's warm. I'm going to lay you down, someone says, distant, like they're speaking through water. One of the nurses at the hospital will heal you soon, so please rest until then. He doesn't need rest. He needs to know that his students are okay. Your students are fine is the patient response, and he realizes that he must have spoken aloud. We're taking care of them, so you should focus on yourself now. His students are not fine, 
His students are young and traumatized and abused, and now one of them might be dead. Midoriya wasn't breathing. Midoriya could be dead. He searches sluggishly, flicking his eyes from side to side, but he's having a hard time figuring out what's going on. He thinks he sees Ryuku sitting quietly in the back of an ambulance while one of the paramedics bandages a split on her brow, battered and exhausted but otherwise unharmed. He thinks he sees police officers stooping over the unconscious villain, strapping heavy restraints around his arms, his legs, his muzzle. He thinks he sees a flash of ash blonde atop a stretcher, paramedics working urgently to clean away the scarlet that continues to creep steadily from hidden wounds. He thinks he sees a flash of green, lying flat on the ground, swarms of paramedics crowding around, their frantic yelling disturbing the still air. Hands land on his shoulders, pressing him gently down. You need to lie down, is the firm command, the paramedic rightly determining that watching the scene is only making things worse. He doesn't want to lie down, but those hands are insistent, growing firmer and firmer when he tries to resist, and before long he's too tired to press back. He lets himself go down hitting the scratchy fabric pulled taut over the stretcher, and he's suddenly staring up at an ashy sky. His arm burns, and his head hurts, and he's so tired. Something pinches in the crook of his good arm. He moves to swat it away, thinking that it's a bug bite, but he remembers too late that his other arm is broken. He'd known that. He'd known his arm was broken. He blinks, and the sky changes, changes to plated silver and the panels held together with these tiny rivets that catch the artificial light inside the ambulance. Sirens ring in his ears. He blinks, and the sky changes again, changes to a blank, white ceiling and frantic voices. Something is beeping, loud and steady. He has to sleep, someone says, vague and drifting. This is going to hurt. Well, he's not going to sleep on his own. He's been here an hour and he's still wide awake. And no one gave him anything? There's a kid dying on the other side of that wall. He hasn't exactly been a priority. Dying. Dying. The beeping picks up, growing faster. His chest feels tight. Oh, shit. Sedate him. Now. He floats. The waiting room is loud. The clock on the far wall is the biggest offender, counting off the seconds, the minutes, the hours, as if he gives a damn how long he's been here. The hollow click of the second hand is as piercing as a hammer hitting a nail, loud in a sort of way that turning on a television or listening to someone else's conversation might actually make the room seem quieter. But there is no television, and no one in the room is speaking, and so the clock crows out the passage of every second with a painful ring, though that might just be the remnants of his concussion. Someone sniffles across the room, and noise makes his head throb. He should have brought earplugs. He tips his head against the back of the padded chair, closing his eyes in an attempt to block out that incessant clicking. It doesn't work. Cloth rustles in the chair to his right, a short sigh following the noise. Shoda. Don't. Another sigh. You should go home. I'll call you if there's any news. He refuses to dignify that statement with a response, squeezing his eyes shut even harder as if he can make the man in the seat beside him vanish into thin air. But of course he can't. The ticking of clock is only growing louder, and his head is pounding. Shoda. If you can't be quiet, then go back to Yue. You're giving me a headache. Hisashi watches him for a moment, disapproving. Then the chair creaks, his shoes thudding across the linoleum of the waiting room, and Shoda really thinks that he might have shaken him. He'd feel bad if he weren't so tired. But of course, things are never that easy, just as Shoda starts to zone back out. The sound of Hizashi's shoes reemerges, and he hears the man drop back into the chair beside him. Fingers curl around his wrist, coaxing him to turn his palm up flat. Two pills are pressed into his hand, followed by a paper cup, and Hizashi just says, Take them. He cracks an eye open, examining the pills. Are you trying to knock me out? If I knocked you out, I'd have to carry you back to the car. It's for your headache. Right. There's a reason he puts up with Hisashi's loudness, and it's because he somehow manages to be annoyingly observant and kind. Shota has no clue how he does it. He takes the pills. The water in the cup makes him feel a bit better. He must be dehydrated. But before he can say anything, Hisashi is handing him another cup, this one larger than the last, and he takes a grateful sip. Stupid, considerate hero. You should go home, Hisashi tells him once he's done drinking like he doesn't already know. If you don't regain your strength, you'll have to finish healing your arm the natural way. 
My arm is fine. Hizashi raises an incredulous eyebrow, poking his cast in emphasis. It will be fine. It can wait until we have more news on the kids. If you aren't careful, Nezu is going to come down here himself. I'm on sick leave. He can't give me orders. Exactly. Sick leave, which means you should be resting, not sitting here waiting for news that I could call you with from home. Shota glares at him, hoping to scare him away, but it doesn't work. Izashi has dug his heels in, and he's always been a stubborn person. If he's made up his mind that Shota should go home, there's not much he's going to be able to do to change it. Shota, he says again, beginning to sound like something of a broken record. Go home. But Shota can be stubborn, too. Not until I know they're okay. Because it's been well over twelve hours, and he's heard nothing. Granted, he had been asleep for six of those hours, having been knocked out by whatever drug the hospital staff had shot him up with. He should have been asleep for longer, based on the flabbergasted expression on his nurse's face when he'd fought his way back to consciousness. They'd tried to get him to lie back down to rest, but he'd put up such a fight that they'd finally agreed to let him go. His concussion, arm, and ribs had already been mostly healed, after all, thanks to a nurse with a particularly potent quirk. All that remains now is a nasty headache and the cast on his arm, which he'll have Shuzenji finish healing once he gets back to campus and rests for a while. The nurses had probably assumed that he would go home, but instead he'd planted himself in the waiting room, where Hizashi had already been waiting for him, and had resolved not to go home until he had some news of his students' conditions. It's been nearly eight hours since then, and nothing. Other people have been by, of course. Yagi had spent several hours pacing in the corner, chewing the side of his thumb as he worried. Namuri had made an appearance and had spent a while fruitlessly trying to convince Shoto to go home. Midoriya and Bakugo's families are also somewhere in the hospital, based on what Hizashi has told him. But they're not in the waiting room. He doesn't even want to know what they're thinking right now. Yue had promised them that their children would be safe. And now... He's just relieved that Nezu had the presence of mind to confine all UA students to campus for the foreseeable future. If he hadn't, the waiting room would be packed with students, all of them clamoring after their friends' safety. And while Shota understands their concern, and would normally seek to ease their worries, he doesn't think he has the strength to deal with them at the moment. He hardly has the strength to deal with himself right now. A hand settles on his shoulder, gentle. Make me a deal, Izashi proposes. We can stay right here until nighttime, if that's what'll make you happy. But as soon as it gets dark, you have to go home and wait for me to call you. Shota glances up at the clock, trying to gauge the number of hours that'll give him. It's still morning, their rescue having taken place in the early hours of the night. So he'll be able to sit here for nearly another twelve hours before he has to leave. The doctors will surely have more information for them by that time. And besides, if it gets Hizashi off his back... He gives a short nod. Deal. Izashi smiles in that annoying, bright way of his, and Shota can almost hear the self-satisfaction knocking around in his head. If not for the gravity of the situation, he'd probably be crowing in triumph, pleased at having bartered Shota into something fairly reasonable. But Izashi knows just as well as Shota that this situation isn't one to be made light of, and so he just squeezes his shoulder and withdraws to his own seat. The room seems just a bit less noisy after that. Around six o'clock that evening, the doctor finally emerges. The doctor has already gone to Midoriya and Bakugo's families, but because Shota had shoved his way into all of the Class 1A's emergency contact forms after the USJ, he gets to be the second person on the list when it comes to their medical updates. And it's a good thing, too, because the sun is just about to sink beneath the horizon, and Hizashi is already preparing to drag him out of the hospital by force if he refuses to leave. The doctor steps through the door, his expression grim, and the world stands still. Shota leaves Hizashi behind as he follows the doctor to a more private space, his heart in his throat. The last time he'd seen his students had been nearly 24 hours ago. He's sure that Bakugo has survived. His blood loss had been serious but not deadly. But Midoriya... As soon as the door closes behind them, there is nowhere left to hide from reality. Bakugo is first, as the less injured of the two. His diagnosis is fairly standard. Serious blood loss, a fractured arm, a twisted ankle, and a flurry of long slashes down his arms and over his chest. His eye had been injured by the villain's last attack, but not so severely that he'll lose his vision. He'd had a transfusion and a lengthy session with one of the hospital's nurses, and is being kept asleep while the remnants of the villain's venom work their way out of his system. 
By the time he awakens, he should be exhausted and aching, but otherwise unharmed. It's good news. It means that at least one of his students will make a full recovery. But then the doctor reaches Midoriya's file, and his expression darkens. His injuries were far more severe, the doctor says, like he's trying to gauge how Shoto's going to react. The most concerning injuries were the five lacerations in his side, which were the source of most of his blood loss. He's lost more than 20% of the blood in his body, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you is very serious. In addition, the freezing temperatures he was subjected to. Is he alive? Shota interrupts sharply, the description of Midoriya's injuries making his stomach turn. He knows how bad his wounds had been. He'd seen them firsthand. He doesn't need to hear a goddamn summary. The doctor, to his credit, doesn't look surprised at the outburst. Instead, he says, For the moment, yes. He's alive. 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 Midoriya's still breathing. He hadn't bled to death in that tunnel. He's... But we're not sure if he's going to recover. All the air whooshes out of his lungs in a single, massive breath, leaving him dizzy and trembling. As I was saying, the combination of blood loss, mild hypothermia, and the fear-inducing drug in his system was devastating. Paramedics were able to restore his breathing within a reasonable time frame, so we don't believe that he'll suffer any long-term effects from oxygen deprivation. However, we have some concerns about the damage that's been done to his heart. His heart. Shota's going to be sick. The venom in his body caused his heart rate to rise to dangerous levels for an extended period of time. The doctor continues, flipping a page in the cluster of papers he's holding. The amount of blood he'd lost worsened the situation considerably. By the time he reached us, he was well on his way to heart failure. And, oh God, the thought of his 15-year-old student's heart failing is like being doused with cold water. No child should ever be put in this situation. It should never have gone this far. The doctor glances to him, seemingly concerned by his silence, but he still goes on. Even a few more minutes and he likely would have died before he reached us. We barely managed to stabilize him even with the time we had. But the important thing is we did stabilize him, at least for the moment. But he's learned the hard way. Stable does not mean safe. What are his chances? He asks low. We're not sure. He's too exhausted to withstand any further healing, so we've done all we can for him until he regains his strength naturally. If he makes it through the next few days, he'll at least have a chance. A chance. Just a chance. Shota takes a deep, slow breath, trying to ground himself. I'm sorry, the doctor says softly. I wish I had better news for you. But for the moment, all we can do is wait. And what about Bakako? Can I... Only family can see either of them tonight, is the response, and he sounds genuinely apologetic. If their families agree, you can come back tomorrow and see them then. It's reasonable, he knows that, but he also hates it, because after sitting in the waiting room for hours on end, he wants something more concrete than, we'll see. He wants the doctor to tell him that Midoriya is going to be okay. Life is more difficult than that, unfortunately, and that's not what happens. What happens is this. He's led back out into the waiting room where Hisashi is already on his feet and pacing, and the doctor vanishes back behind closed doors. Hisashi grabs his arm, alarmed, and his expression shatters when Shota repeats what the doctor had told him. He wants to stay in the waiting room after that, afraid that Midori might die in the night and he won't be here to know about it. But Hisashi is firm. A deal is a deal, regardless of the doctor's bad news, and he refuses to take no for an answer. I'll call Toshinori he says as he coaxes Shoda to the exit of the hospital. He'll be happy to stay here and report back if anything happens. He doesn't want Yagi to have to relay the information to him. He wants to be here so he can hear it for himself. But Hisashi is very firm. If he doesn't follow him promptly out of the hospital, he will scream and get them kicked out. And because Shoda wants to be able to come back tomorrow to see his students, he follows without a word. Hisashi takes him back to his own apartment, probably assuming that Shoda isn't in any condition to take care of himself. It's not an unwarranted assumption. Hisashi has known him for a long time, and back when he was still an active underground hero, he'd often respond, with despondency whenever he'd lost someone in the field. And while Midoriya isn't dead, not yet, the situation is so dire that it feels just as shattering. He's deposited into the bed in the guest room, which he's become more than familiar with over the years. So familiar, in fact, that he knows without looking that he has a spare toothbrush in the bedside drawer and a few sets of clean clothing in the closet. Though Hisashi protests, 
He wrestles himself into that clothing, brushes his teeth in an attempt to flush out the remaining tang of iron, and scrubs his face until it turns pink. I promise to go home, not to sleep, he points out when Hizashi tries to herd him back to bed, telling him again that he needs to rest. What if Toshinori calls while I'm out? I'll wake you up. But, Shota, there is literally no reason for you to stay awake. I promise I'll wake you up the instant the phone rings. That way you can listen in. He narrows his eyes at him, suspicious. I promise. Well, Hizashi does have a good track record when it comes to keeping promises. I'm setting an alarm, Shota informs him, fumbling for his phone on instinct before he remembers it had been crushed in the rubble. Visiting hours start at six o'clock, right? We're going to be there when the doors open. Hizashi sighs, but he doesn't protest, probably figuring that he's won a battle just by getting Shota to take a nap. Let me, he relents, tapping his phone a few times, then flipping it so he can see the screen. There, an alarm set for 5.30. That'll give us more than enough time to get back to the hospital before visiting hours start. He squints at the screen, making sure that the alarm is indeed set for the proper time. Only then does he finally agree to make his way back to the bed, hitting it like a sack of rocks. It's the first time he's really gotten to rest since he'd awoken early Thursday morning, and it's Friday evening now. It's hard to believe that such a horrific disaster could strike in less than 48 hours. Two days ago, his biggest concern had been trying to build trust between Midoriya and Bakugo. Food first, then sleep, Hizashi tells him, appearing with a mug of soup. And because Shota is exhausted, and he is a bit hungry, he downs the soup as ordered. Then another dose of medicine, pressed into his hand, and this time he doesn't question what he's being fed. His head hits the pillow, and though there's so much more he needs to think about, so much more he needs to consider, he doesn't get the chance. He sleeps. And he awakens at noon the next day. Liar! He snarls at Hizashi, who stands defeatedly in the corner as Shota rampages. You said you set an alarm. You slept through the alarm. You should have woken me up. I tried to wake you up. You wouldn't budge. Then, you did drug me. The second dose of medicine. Those were sleeping pills. A pause. Well, Shota issues him a wordless snarl, chucking his pajama shirt at him as he fishes for the spare hoodie he knows is buried somewhere in the wardrobe. Traitor. Hizashi catches the shirt without a struggle. Sorry, he offers, but he doesn't even try to sound like he means it. They make it to the hospital shortly after, Shota glaring at Hizashi the whole way there. Yagi isn't in the waiting room, but Namuri is, probably having taken his place in the middle of the night. She smiles tiredly when she sees them, but it doesn't reach her eyes. Any news? Shota asks. Actually, yes. Namuri gets to her feet, cringing as she stretches out after a presumably long night in an uncomfortable chair. The doctor was looking for you just a little while ago. His heart leaps. What did he say? That Bakugo is ready for visitors. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 6 of Fellow Feeling. Chapter 7 will be up next. I really like this chapter a lot because not only does it deal with, you know, the immediate after effects of them getting to the hospital, but it also showcases, like, Hizashi forcing Shota to go home and to get some rest and things like that and take care of himself, despite the fact that he desperately wants to stay at the hospital, which... I just think the author portrayed that really well. So I'm eager to hear your thoughts and reactions to this as well. And as always, thank you so much for listening.